Moving on to the corporate panel, we've got um, seven um, companies represented here. We have uh, Cheryl Peterson from the Avis Budget Group over here, and from BAE Systems, James Rodriguez. Everybody's coming up right now. From CVS, Rich Jones. Coming up in the back. He's the fellow with a bow tie because he said Friday is bow tie Friday. It's a protest against uh, casual Friday, right? All right. Um, <clears throat> from City, John Tien, who's a managing director there and an R I should say a U.S. Army veteran. Um, uh, from GE, Chris Erbauer, who's also a U.S. Army veteran, West Point graduate. She's at the end. Uh, from Home Box Office, Hardy Egham, who is uh, a U.S. Navy veteran. Um, I should also say, I miss that we've got some Marines, the BAE Systems, James Rodriguez is a Marine, and uh, John Tien is a uh, Army guy. Over the next five years, there's going to be um, a million vets that are going to come out of the military. And so employment is a critical, critical issue um, for those of you out there and also for your brethren who are going to be leaving the military. The unemployment rate among um, post 9-11 vets who are 18 to 24 is now 36 percent and that's uh, deplorable. We need to do something about that. So the question that I wanted to pose to the panel, the first of, 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 of several questions is um, what do you feel are the job and career prospects over the next five years for military veterans in your industry? Chris, why don't we start with you in GE. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, Happy to be here, first of all. Well, the interesting thing about GE is we're into everything. So I guess the prospects in everything are varied. I'll start with that. We've got about 300,000 employees worldwide, 150,000 employees in the US. At any one time, we've got two to 3,000 open positions across the country. But you know, once again, they're in a variety of things from aviation manufacturing, locomotive manufacturing, financial services, software development, Healthcare services, healthcare manufacturing, I'm going to forget something, oil and gas, the energy sector. So we've got, we've got our toes in a lot of different things. Um, so, you know, at any one time, some of our businesses are doing better than others, and there's openings, you know, in certain businesses, and there's not maybe as many openings as in other businesses. But the one uh, place where I think that there's always an opportunity uh, to get a job with GE and with, I'm sure, a lot of other companies is in the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, in all of our businesses, we've got those types of openings, mostly in engineering type or software development, all that sort of thing. Um, that's really where we're constantly, constantly, constantly looking for people to fill positions uh, at the managers of engineers, along with you know the folks that actually do the, the technical work. So I think if you've got a background in STEM coupled with your military experience, perhaps you're getting a, an advanced degree in, in some sort of a technical field, um, I really think you've got wonderful prospects for um, employment in many companies across the U.S. and that's all going to lead to uh, you know, raising American competitiveness in, in all the different industries out there. Thanks, Chris. Let's move to CBS for a moment. Um, Rich, do you want to comment on? Well, listen, yeah, thanks, Scott, uh, and, and welcome, everyone. Uh, and thanks so much for all that you've done uh, so far uh, in answering the call for our great country. And uh, so as I look at the media entertainment space, um, obviously, you know, CBS, what are we known for? We're known for world-class news, world-class entertainment, and sports. So there's a lot of jobs that, that uh, you know, are, are w which would be intuitive to that, and then there are things that, that, that you know, are very specific to skill sets that you learned in the military. Um, and I would say that, that uh, I would encourage you to, to uh, take a look as, as part of your search, um, because we, we, we run the gamut of finance to, you know, news gathering. Um, we, we have... Uh, uh, we, we have 21,000 employees, and we are we're very, very supportive uh, of, of veterans, uh, and realize uh, that they are one of our greatest natural resources. Um, but in terms of prospects, um, again, we grow along with uh, the you know we 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 have an advertising uh, model as part of our business, and so as the economy does well, 
the company does well, and uh, that, that ebbs and flows with, with uh, employment. So I'd say that we are probably going to be on pace to be a replacement, you know, as, as again, demographic changes, uh, demographic uh, uh, trends, you're going to have a big uh, 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 drop off as, as the baby boomer generation starts to retire. And obviously, you know, we're all about making sure that we have uh, uh, world class uh, professionals to uh, be part of, uh, of, of the company on a go forward basis to, as a succession plan. So I'd encourage you uh, to look, and again, this, I'm sure this will be highlighted, but um, don't let your MOS define who you are because you know, at the end of the day, what you are, broadly speaking, is problem solvers, and, and, and we can use problem solvers. Those are the kind of folks we want, uh, um, as Chris said, as part of uh, uh, making sure that America remains competitive. And ultimately, when we look at it from a business perspective, that, that's, that's, that's the best thing to add to shareholder value. Thank you. And at BAE Systems, James? Well, I'd like to say we're the biggest defense and aerospace company that nobody really knows about. <laughs> so we're, we're working on that. We're working on that as a, from a marketing perspective. But BAE Systems, defense and aerospace company, roughly about 100,000 employees worldwide. We uh, have about approximately 36 to 38,000 employees in the United States alone, about 120 locations across the United States, give or take. Uh, anything that you can think of in the military, as far as MOSs, if you're looking for a career path in that MOS that you have a background in, we have pretty much within our business. When I say defense and aerospace, that pretty much resonates with everybody because we have positions that range from mechanics, welders, IT, cyber, logistics, I can go on and on from all of the wide thousands of MOSs that all branches have. So you have an opportunity within our company. The hiring, though, is based off of, as a defense company, contract awards, contract wins. So the, the, the hiring can fluctuate. Sometimes it's more this month, sometimes more next month, depends on contract award, contract wins. The beauty of it, though, is that we're constantly hiring. As Chris mentioned, at any given time, we have a couple of thousand jobs open. So we're constantly hiring, even in a down market. There's opportunities for, for uh, veterans all across from entry level to mid-level to senior level based off of your, your education, your background, those type of things. So we are going to be hiring. We're we'll continue to hire along with uh, just traditional openings. There's going to be openings specifically for veterans. And that's why we have a military recruitment manager within the business that actually works with specifically for veterans to get them employed within our business. And John at, at City. Yep, so uh, broadly, first for the financial services industry, not just for Citi, uh, you know, you, financial services is pretty broad, uh, and you really should think about, and I know we have some, obviously, New York residents in here, so apologize if this is sort of uh, too fundamental, but there's really Wall Street, and then there's Main Street, right? And so you have the investment bank, the corporate side, trading security, largely a lot of the folks who work in this building here at 388 Greenwich and on Wall Street, right? And then you have... Main Street, which is more of the, uh, the corner uh, bank that you see, the brick and mortar, and also all of the online products like cards, uh, mortgages, and just your normal consumer bank. Really two very different aspects of the financial services industry. Uh, I would say that the, obviously, uh, the financial crisis and the recession, that took a hit to all of the Fortune 500 companies, but in particular financial services. We're coming out of that, and what the good news is uh, we're, we're hiring again. We're probably not expanding, right? But we definitely are hiring. Um, Rich used the term replacement. You know, we have at Citigroup alone 260,000 employees worldwide, about 80 to 100,000 uh, in North America, depending how you define uh, contractors and extended uh, employee workforce. And if you think about it, we're going to go through, just like the military, not 33% turnover the way you do in a military unit, but we're going to have at least 10 to 15,000 we're going to be hiring in North America. And that's just Citigroup, because you know, we belong to veterans on Wall Street, so you have Chase and uh, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, I mean, all these financial services firms are relatively scaled in the same way. So I think the job prospects are pretty good. Uh, and then at least within uh, my part portion of the bank consumer, I do operations and technology, which is more the back office, the manufacturing, collections, um, counter fraud, uh, credit card production, all those sorts of things that you need to run the bank on. Mm -hmm. So I think that pretty good prospects. Good to hear. And Harry Wingo is here from Google, and he's a uh, Navy SEAL. What's your perspective on that, Harry? Um, 
First not on the Navy SEAL, but I mean on the internet. <laughs> First, I want to say thank you uh, for your service. And uh, as far as Google goes, we're in the uh, tech space, and the economy is recovering. But uh, the good news is that technology just remains uh, one of the you know, very, very uh, growing parts of our economy. Uh, one thing I'd like to get across is that you don't have to be a computer programmer to work at Google. That's a misconception that's out there. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, roles and opportunities uh, across the country and all over the world. Uh, we are growing. I manage a program at Google that's trying to hire more military veterans. Uh, I've been at Google for four years. I've been full-time focused on this uh, for almost a year now. And I think one thing that we come across is people say, well, I didn't know uh, that Google did more than just folks who are writing computer code. Um, we have anything from sales to advertising uh, to our data centers. Uh, but I will say, uh, as far as the STEM fields go, uh, if you know, science, technology, engineering, math, very important. Uh, if, if you have used technology, and there's a lot of that in the military now, um, to, just to get a sense, anyone here use uh, IT or in the IT, IT fields within the military? Can you raise your hand? Okay, great. There you go. That helps. Um, our office in New York, it's our second uh, largest in the world. Uh, I think getting up to close to 3,000 people now. So for us, I mean, the prospects are good. Uh, one part of the military, as an example, uh, the nuclear submarine force. Those folks in our data centers, and our data centers, it's the infrastructure that makes all of this work. You do a search, and within shorter than it takes you to blink your eye, you get the answer back, no matter where you are, if you've got access to the internet. What really makes that work is not just the computers. Like, if you'd be, some people are surprised to hear that if you've got a background as an electrician, or you've worked on HVACs, or you understand uh, un <laughs> uninterruptible power supplies, mm -hmm. we need you. Um, and think about it, a nuclear submarine, if it, those folks are really at home in our data centers. And that's just one example. So I think for us, the prospects, you know, if you're in the tech space, uh, if you're all interested in, te in technology, uh, we, we've got roles. I encourage you to take a look uh, at it. And we have folks who are there to, like, help guide you through the process as veterans. We have uh, veterans at Google, an inter internal group, and we pair off and, and try to serve as mentors for folks who are coming into the process. Great. And Hardy's, uh, from the HBO perspective? Um, well, the HBO, I think the little guy up here, we have uh, probably just over 2,000 employees. So um, overall, the message probably I want to say is, um, unlike Google saying we don't have programmers, we absolutely do have programmers, and we're trying to lead in a lot of tech spaces. Um, with the uh, internet and the delivery of internet tech videos, that's adding to a lot of change to our environment um, that we're aggressively pursuing. Um, fortunately, in a economic downturn, pay-per-view outside of uh, um, commercial-based programming, we tend to do better. So um, in this space right now, our programming has been fortunately outstanding. Um, I watch it myself. Um, you know, it's, it's just that we're, oh, you have one? Yeah. sorry about that. Our uh, um, hiring, we're actively looking um, all the time. Our offices are uh, in New York here, and we also have just recently, because of the uh, talent pools out in Seattle, we've started to uh, build up a, a, a software programming center out in uh, um, the Seattle area. And then we do have a full data center that was just uh, completed last year out in Hop Hog in the middle of Long Island. So we're uh, uh, very aggressive in the New York area as well. And now the Avis Budget Group. Hi, welcome and thank you for your service. Um, our industry is a growing industry. It was uh, severely impacted by the recession and always will be by uh, travelers. So the more that corporate travel goes down, the more that our business will go down. Good thing is corporate travel as well as leisure travel is up. Um, we are also experiencing some growth through acquisition. Uh, two years ago, we acquired Avis Europe, so we are now a global company. Um, we also have just acquired Zipcar. Uh, so from a technology perspective, we also have opportunities that now we might not have had before with our engineering, um, obviously building that software that goes behind the rental of a uh, quick rental that Zipcar does. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, from an operations perspective, um, the jobs that we have are seasonal, so you will see spikes go up and down, but we're always looking for in our operations manager trainee role, uh, military candidates that can join the organization because we will take you through a full operations management program that teaches you about sales, teaches you about the operation itself, teaches you about all the different back of the house um, systems, learns, uh, teaches you how to uh, 
be a better business person and it's a 32 week program and you graduate from that and then you get to be in a location and have a team that you support so really good role we're growing in that area uh, offers a lot of opportunity right now and those opportunities are across North America we hire about 6,000 a year in North America and we have about 26,000 employees right now okay let's drill down a little bit more on this uh, the question is what is your company doing in terms of its hiring procedures, practices, or policies that you believe is really making a difference in attracting military veterans uh, as employees? Chris, you want to start on that? Sure. Um, we kind of pride ourselves on continuing to try to develop our military or veteran-friendly brand as a company. Uh, there is a gentleman who is devoted to military staffing and recruiting. Uh, who manages kind of our overall military hiring program. In addition to the fact that, uh, as you may or may not know, we publicly declared uh, last February that we were going to hire 1,000 veterans a year for the next five years. Uh, we had never made a public commitment like that about any group, actually, uh, in the history of the company. So that was kind of a big deal. But the thing about that is that came directly from the CEO and each of our eight businesses has their own goal within that thousand that they are responsible for hitting. So the senior HRM for each business along with an operations lead from each business actually own that number and it is their responsibility to drive that number just like they drive their, uh, their P&Ls and, and their results uh, for the company, for the shareholders. So we've got the top-down strategy along with the fact we've got 10,000 veterans within the U.S. working for the company. Uh, we're all a part of the GE Veterans Network, of which I'm one of the co-leaders of that as my, one of my many hats I wear. Um, and we really utilize those veterans that already work for GE to help us, first of all, find more veterans that are interested in the company, help the HR and recruiting process with the resume translation if necessary with really just kind of vouching for the skills that each of you bring to the table. Uh, also then, once we get into the interview process, participating in the interview process, uh, when and if we do hire new veterans, linking them up as they get onboarded into the company to learn the culture, to you know make that adjustment into the the strange language of GE from from the military. So you know with the network we've got within, along with the uh, emphasis from the top, uh, you know, we're like I said, we're always striving to improve our military-friendly brand. James, you want to talk about BAE? Okay, we also have a uh, military recruitment page that's specifically for military transitioning, and it has my good friend Chris Davidson's my former role in there, his contact information, and my information still on there uh, because I'm a veteran advocate. And uh, what that does is that actually gives them a sole source of contact information with somebody's name, phone number, and email address so they can help them with the transition into the company. We also part participate in national career fairs that uh, Higher Heroes puts on with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We participate in transition assistance programs or the, the new program uh, that the military rolled out, do that. But uh, again, I'll, I'll say, as Chris mentioned, because we do a lot of these together, is that a lot of the time it comes just from veteran networking. So we have our veterans for our businesses. As I mentioned, we have over 100 sites across the country. So our veterans are out in the community representing their business and within that community. So we do a lot of veterans local stuff there. And then we do it and we have an internal veterans network and SharePoint site that we share this information across the entire country for our veterans. And that information is disseminated. So if they have a relative or a friend, and I think uh, Rich may have mentioned this earlier, if you have a relative and you're looking for a job, your relative may be able to find you a job or you have a friend may be able to find you a job. So that's why that veterans networking internal site is important because when we're looking for a job, they may be able to refer somebody into that position. So we do that and we keep a focus on all of that. Uh, other than that, it's just mainly veterans networking. Yeah. City has stepped out pretty aggressively in this area too, John. Want to fill us in there? Yep. Uh, thanks, Scott. The, um, similar to all of the, my colleagues up here on this panel, you're looking at uh, seven veterans-friendly companies, right? And I think uh, Chris said it well when she said it's got to start at the top. So our major practice is uh, we have convinced ourselves and our hiring managers and our CEO and all of the leaders in the company that hiring veterans is not just good for you, right, but is good for us, right? And that's huge. None of you guys or any of us up here want this to be a charity. Uh, we, want, we want to see ourselves as value added to the, to the bottom line. And it is for all of the reasons, uh, you know, adaptive, centered, 
capable, flexible leader, program manager, all of those things that uh, I'm sure other folks have already spoken to you about. That's a huge practice, and it's really about attitude. And when you look at veteran-friendly companies, some of the ways that you might want to measure that is you could look at GI jobs and see, did you fall on the top 100 list, and the amount of ads and markets and everything else out there. But I, I think all of the companies up here uh, have these landing sites, right? Uh, we just talked about up here. Ours is www.citysalutes.com. Dot com, citysalutes.com. There's some cards out there on the table that actually talk about an ebook that we just came up with with uh, NBC Universal. But that landing page, where you, when you go there, you'll get a sense not just from the hiring perspective, but as a company, how supportive we are of veterans to you as, as a future possible employees, but also to our own internal thousands of employees who are veterans, and then back out into the communities. Plus, what we do for our consumers. So if you can get that sort of uh, 100, 360 degree ecosystem that says to you, this is a veterans friendly company, then go for it. And obviously we've won awards like Department of Defense Freedom Award uh, for the Employer Supportive Guard and Reserve Act. That's important if you're a reservist. Even if you're not a guardsman or reservist, you look at that and say, wow, these guys are gonna do pay differential uh, and, and help out uh, and, and let me keep my benefits and guarantee my, my same level of job when I come back. That's probably coming even if you're not a reservist or a guardsman, has a good sort of veterans culture to it. And the last thing is we have programs like the one I run, which is the Junior Military Officer Leadership Program. It says the word officer because uh, it just got too long to say officer, non-commissioned officer, but it is really for any junior leaders who have served four to six years in the military, transitioning in the last two years. And we're looking for you to be platoon leaders, platoon sergeants, and company commanders. Same level of scope and responsibility. You got three six-month rotations at the VP level, VP pay, and then we give you a job at the end. Not a bad, not a bad deal. We not scale. GE has a program like this. I think other folks have it too. And at Google, so at Google we have uh, some initiatives both on the external side. A big thing is get is outreach. Just getting the word out uh, that Google is a place that veterans should consider. Uh, after that, as far as growing the pipeline, uh, we've worked with external partners like Student Veterans of America. We had an event last year where they had their leadership summit and we volunteered to host uh, that summit at Google's headquarters. IVMF joined uh, that as well. Uh, we had an event where we had 20 uh, undergrad and graduate level uh, student veterans come on campus and spend two days with us. And they had some, you know, we had some workshops. We talked about, uh, you know, what it's like to make the transition into the private sector. We're doing that program again uh, this year. We've had scholarships, uh, you know, we're on the IT side of things. Not everybody is a programmer at Google, but we definitely have uh, software engineers and people who do program. And so trying to grow that pool uh, with veterans as well, we've had scholarships. We gave out eight scholarships, $10,000 each, to veterans who are working on their computer science degree. Uh, we're doing that again this year. Uh, we're hiring someone from that program. We had a, an outreach thing. We had coding, a coding contest just for military vets who write code. I think we're the first company to do that, but as a way to identify where this talent is. Once you get into the pipeline, and this is what I focus on, and I've, I've got colleagues internally. There's a Marine, Sean Washington, uh, who was several years in the, in the uh, Marine Corps. He and I, if you send an email to us at veteran underscore interest at google.com, it's uh, under my bio uh, in the sheet for today. That'll come in. We ask you to look at the job page ahead of time first. Identify that's in your resume. And the internal processes that we have is we'll look at that. Um, you know, we'll figure out whether there's a match. Uh, we'll talk to other veterans because we have an employee resource group. We have veterans at Google. We'll pair up and say, hey, what's your perspective on this person if they have a similar experience? If they were Air Force and we find someone who's Air Force, if, if you're a Marine and you're interested in logistics at Google, uh, then, you know, we'll pair up or think. If you're looking at finance. <coughs> and after that, we'll go back and we'll, we'll contact. We'll have a discussion with you. And we'll say, hey, maybe you want to fine tune this on your resume. Or maybe when you move into the phase of having an interview, if things progress, here are some things to think about, you know, and, and talk to you, answer questions about Google culture. And we're finding that it's good to pair up veterans internally with veterans who are going through the process. And so we're still fine tuning our game on that. And we have lots of other examples, um, you know, of companies that are doing this and we share notes on it. And so I think that's a really important thing. The other big thing that we're doing, Scott, that we're excited about is partnering with others in the industry. So there's groups like this, and we'd like to thank Veterans Advantage for convening this, where we're sharing best practices. And you'll see some commonalities between what we do and what others are doing. But I think really getting out there and comparing notes and you learn something all the time. And then finally, 
uh, and this is just big for Google, we're proud that uh, people sp spend a lot of time with us. Like we help people get through their day. Search, if you're on the internet, there are all these tools out there for technology to help you connect, to help you connect with each other, to share your stories. YouTube, you could upload what it's like to be going through school right now, what it's like to make the transition. And so being part of that system and allowing folks to get information, uh, to search and, and, and find things as they make this transition, that's another thing that we're always trying to find better ways to do it, sharing ways that, you know, that are working well. And it doesn't have to only be Google. I'm very quick to remind people, if you don't have a LinkedIn account, you should sign up. You should use it actively. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, all these companies have a role. But at Google, we've got the internal uh, aspects, getting you in. And once you get there, too, by the way, making sure you stay. So we've got, you know, like the, uh, on the HR side, but also with the veterans, our support group internally, nurturing veterans and figuring out this is, this is maybe the path you want to consider inside. So those are a couple of things that we're doing at Google to, you know, both attract talented veterans and then uh, hold on to them once they go. And, and speaking of holding on to them, if uh, you haven't been to Google headquarters here in New York, you'll quickly find out that uh, there's no uh, food station that is more than 100 yards from any employee. <laughs> is that I right? Believe in chow. Is that That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, HBO has been a, a big supporter of veterans. Um, leadership at the top matters. Uh, the former CEO just retired, Bill Nelson, is a Vietnam veteran, and uh, he's been a tireless supporter of, of, of veterans over the years. And Hardy, maybe you could fill us in a little bit more about what's going on there. Yeah, Bill really just uh, tried to push us to get out there and continue to look at veterans as an um, angle of improving our uh, culture. Um, good example is uh, Beer Hero, Stan uh, Beer Hero, Hire a Hero. Uh, last two years running, we had a table. They had recruiters out there, and um, last year they did bring in two uh, veterans and hired them right in. Uh, we continue to do outreach programs, trying to get the word out that being a veteran, you can make um, career choices. Um, we have what's called Veterans in Production. Uh, it's a program that brings veterans in and uh, gets them familiar with what's going on. And I believe that program last year they did a, a higher six uh, under the sports side. Um, as far as job careers and expos, I want to just kind of finally, you know, finalize that, uh, you know, you always hear it's uh, your referrals of how you get in, you see the big numbers. Um, I'm actually a product of my transition into the uh, civilian world, it was through a job fair, it was showing up to one of these things, dropping my resume in and then showing up. So it does make a difference in, you know, any way, any avenue, you try them all because you don't know which one's going to work. Cheryl? Yes. Hi. So um, at Avis Budget Group, we start with our career site and having a specific site that's for military veterans. It tells you a little bit about working at Avis Budget Group and what it means to us to have you there. We also, from there, have a Avis Budget Group dash veterans dot jobs link that you can go to, which takes you right to all of the jobs. On there is a MOS translator. Now, the MOS translator is not the end-all be-all. It will definitely get you pointed in the right direction. I will tell you that a lot of the jobs in the military that we have found are really good fits for those operation manager trainees, and we do hire a lot of those, so it's always going to show that. Um, but we do take into consideration that there are other opportunities that you might be a fit for as well. The other beautiful thing that it does is it tags you as a military candidate when you go through there. And we've made a commitment at Avis Budget Group that we won't just look at a resume of a military candidate, but we'll, we'll ensure, and I, when I say look at a resume, it's not just through the applicant tracking system, that we will have a human eye look at your resume, uh, make decisions in regards to the positions and opportunities that might be a good fit for you, and try to get you in front of or through a phone interview with a recruiter. What we've found is that the applicant tracking systems are all geared towards keywords, and your resumes don't always have the same keywords that we look at in the civilian world. So making that translation is very hard when you're talking about systems. The only way that translation can truly be done, I believe, is through those face-to-face -face interviews, those networking conversations, and learning about who you are. So at Avis Budget Group, we've also created a talent network that you can join. So if you're not a good fit for a position today, or if uh, you're uh, not transitioning right away and we want to keep you in our pipeline, we'll encourage you to join the talent network so that we can continue to have those conversations with you, learn more about you, and as you're making those changes and decisions about what is the right track for you, we're there along with you and helping to guide you and make those decisions and hopefully have you join the organization. I, I, I'd say CBS is doing uh, much of uh, what, what uh, uh, is, is the world-class model that, that uh, the other, pa other panelists have, have discussed. 
um, because we realize, listen, it's, it's, a, um, it's co competitive, right? We, we are all looking for the best people because that's what sustains our businesses. And, uh, you know, a couple of the things that we've done, just again, I think what I noticed um, is that I, I want to make sure that there's, that it's not just form, right? That, that, again, the greatest fear that you have is that, that you submit a resume and then you just never know what happens, right? And so, you know, w which happens. People get busy and, and these things happen. And, you know, I'm all about making sure that, A, there's no wrong doors, right? I'm also uh, want to make sure that, that if, you give advice, it's, it's something that, that's meaningful and not just, you know, we just don't throw it out there. Um, but in terms of, of, of this process, which is very important to you, right, this is, this is, you know, as you transition, you need to make sure it's not just pushing a rope across the room. So the accountability that, that, that we put in place, um, sort of self-inflicted, I, I went to our, our senior leadership and said, listen, you know, we need to have veterans, the reason why we exist as a company that, that, that relies so much upon uh, and has done what we've done because of, of the Constitution, the First Amendment, we need to make sure that, that we're sending a message. There's these days, the sea level, there's chief this, chief that. And I said, you know what? We need to have a chief veteran officer. And so in my role uh, as, as chief veteran officer, I'm at the divisions. And not just, I'm not browbeating people, but I'm saying, listen, here's the value proposition. The research that, that, that uh, Mike Haney had done about the, the, the value proposition, that it makes good business sense, which has been highlighted on this panel. Um, that, again, and you can't fault civilians for not knowing because it's ignorance in the sense of lack of knowledge, right? So it, it's an education process. Let's make sure that people understand that, that um, you know, you guys are a tremendous natural resource. It, it's a translation of skills. But as I said, it, it, it's a competitive environment out there for, for the best talent. And I happen to believe that, that you guys are uh, tremendous talent. And so, um, you know, in addition to all these things, we're, we're making sure that, that, you know, it's not pushing a rope again, uh, across the room, that, that we're giving every resume that comes in, you know, every veteran resume that comes through, I take a look at. Because then I do this sort of, you know, Rosetta Stone, right? This is what <laughs> this person, you should, this is how you should read this resume, and this is why you should hire them. So I think that's because, you know what, it, it, technology is great because it helps us get through reams of data. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm all, all about, and, and you know, it's, it's a military concept, if you're not on the ground, you don't own it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the human element of, of the hiring process is it critical, and making sure our HR people are, are in tuned to that and understand and are sensitive to what you're going through, because people forget what it's like to be on the other side. So, critical. Excellent. Well, let's take a moment here and kind of throw this open to questions to the panel. What's on your mind? What would you like to ask them? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I guess I'll be the first one in the shoot, as they say. Absolutely. Um, That's fine. Uh, my name is Alex, um, I'm an MBA student. Um, so my question to the panel is, how do you guys feel about joining uh, a mentorship program? You know, do you think it benefits? Obviously it does, but um, you know, do you see sort of long-term benefits of having a mentor and joining a program such as uh, ACP? ACP? Right. Yep, so we participate, I'm sure some of these guys do too, in American Corporate Partners. Uh, I actually have a Naval Academy. I, they couldn't find a West Point for some reason for me. Because they didn't need mentors. They already had jobs. But the Navy guy needed a job. <laughs> any rate, um, and it's been great. Uh, he's actually going to interview for a, um, a job here in this building. Uh, but I've actually, you know, it, is, it isn't meant to be, and ACP makes that very clear, it's not meant to be a recruiting pipeline, but sometimes it could sort of turn out to be. I think it's really for him, and obviously I'm saying this from my perspective, but for him it's given him some much broader frameworks to consider uh, and leverage some of my own personal networks, but also some of the professional ones. So if you can get it, because uh, I know it's competitive to get in those mentorship programs, I recommend do it. Um, this is your shot here, guys. Okay. Hi, my name is Alex. Um, as a student veteran, what can I do outside of the academic setting to help uh, progress my professional life? Well, I'll take a shot at that. The, uh, one of the things we do with the student veterans is give them an opportunity to have an internship within our company while they're still 
students because what that does, it allows you to get more professional experience. Because one of the things it also does is teach you about the job that you think you're going to go into. Because what happens a lot of times is, is that veterans have an idea of what a job is going to be. And once you actually get into that job, you're not happy in that job. So keeping the open mind when you go into the internship, you can do multiple internships. That gives you a better understanding of that position and the position requirements. So that's one of the things that we do constantly. We work with student veterans in the Washington, D.C. area, and we give them uh, veteran internship opportunities within our business. So I, I agree 100 percent. And what it also does, it allows you to get a champion, if you will, a mentor, veteran mentor within our company. Because once you're a student veteran, you also get assigned a mentor that's a veteran that's already established in the company. I'm a mentor for a couple of veterans. And what that mentoring, in the, what that mentoring does, it allows you, again, to understand the job that you're going to potentially be doing and other opportunities that may be a better fit for you based off of your background. So it's good to have a mentor. And then after you come into the business, that same mentor could potentially be your mentor if you get hired permanently. I would just add too that uh, there's so much within social media um, as Harry was indicating earlier um, getting on LinkedIn and beginning your networking and forming those relationships there's so much the research that you're doing today if you are a student is uh, geared more towards the academic side start looking at ways to be able to expand there's so many videos out there now that companies put out that are a day in the life show you what it's like to be in that position um, many companies are now producing ones that are military related so that you can see how you make that transition from a military position into a civilian position. So I would do that research as well as you're looking at companies that you want to be employed by so that you get a better understanding before you even go in for the interviews on what those jobs entail. And then that'll help you to gear what types of um, different learning and different uh, programs you might want to go and seek out so that you get the training that you need to be ready for those interviews. Real quick on this too, I think, Alex, great question. I would say also continue to explore your passion, right, and refine your passion. Um, and ask yourself, where do I want to be in five years, ten years? Mm -hmm. That's something, this is a great time to do that if you're still in school. Another thing is from the, from the Google perspective, one thing we like to tell people is one of the best tickets in the Google is to have done something amazing, right? And, and, and really mean that in the sense of whatever it is for you. Because there's so many different versions of amazing and really that's about capturing your passion and turning into something. For us, you know, and there's a lot of companies like, but from the tech perspective, Think about pouring some tech onto whatever it is that you're into. Um, and also, I encourage each of you to be mentors yourself. Mm -hmm. There's ways that you can get engaged. You've got great outfits like uh, Team Rubicon. Um, I think of a, a classmate of mine from the Naval Academy, Mike Monroe, who's a, uh, the, the veteran person over at Points of Light, where they like reach out and connect communities all over. Uh, there's so many places where you can do something amazing to help other veterans, or it could be who knows what it is? It could be cancer research. It could be helping prison populations. It could be STEM education, uh, getting kids in the city involved with, with robotics. A lot of different things. So Alex, what I would say is, or, or whatever your path is for what you want to go into with a career, think about how you can do something in that area that's different. How can you have some innovation? But then also the basic networking. It's great, and I agree with Cheryl, thanks for pointing it out. Can't say enough about the social side of things. But Google Plus, like if you don't have a Google Plus account, get one, start a community. Uh, think about what your passion is. And I, I talked to a vet uh, the last, you know, earlier today, epigenetics. I didn't know what epigenetics was. And I was like, you got a blog? He's like, no, maybe I should start a blog. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> point is, like whatever you're into, get into it deeper. Get into it on the next level. Do the hard work. Figure out if it, it may not be what you really want to do. So again, Tap into your passion even deeper than you have. Figure out how to plot a course to where you're going to, you know, just, you know, just knock it down. Yeah, and real quick on that, on the, a lot of my, my uh, work is with on the technical side, and when we're working with the recruiters, I know specifically in uh, the team we hired, uh, there was an individual that had a lot of uh, contribute, uh, contributed into open source coding, and this was recognized from the recruiter. It was really easy for us once the resume came in and hit the desk to go ahead and take a look and it really gives you almost a leg up right away because the biggest problem is the unknown when you're going to say yes we're going to hire this person there's still that unknown what's going on and as much as you can remove that doubt from the hiring manager you're just you're continuing to build that plus for your for your case to be hired on yes 
Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Shane Strasberg, USMC. Um, I kind of have a off the beaten path kind of question. I'm finishing my master's by the end of the year in anthropology. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, from my own research, the federal government is the number one employer of anthropologists. And number two is Microsoft, which I found interesting. So I think that this question is directed directly at Google, since they're your direct opposition. Um, are there opportunities for people in my field uh, within Google or within the corporate world? Uh, that's, that's a great question, Shane. Um, well, first off, it's just like uh, pickup basketball, right? We've got lots of folks we're competing against. We all like, play off each other and we all get better. So um, Microsoft is interesting. I didn't know that they had, you know, we're focusing on anthropology. I will say we have a range uh, of different folks. You can imagine if marketing and advertising is really key to what we're doing. We have lots of folks who are in the social sciences and, and look at that side of things. Uh, user interface, you know, those types of aspects of just human nature and psychology. And, you know, we, we've, we've got a range. So uh, I would say, you know, it might be worth even exploring even further what's at Google. We, we can talk about that. Um, I think as far as opportunities, and if, if at first you may not see it, actually you probably do see connections on even anthropology for the tech side of it. If you've got ways to use uh, you know, social networks, what's on you, you know, what are you doing on YouTube about, you know, anthropology to, you know, both pursue your passion, but also get out there in a deeper way with the community, because one, it's going to help you up your game in the career, you know, career field you want to go into. But then to my point about, uh, you know, the general statement about do something amazing, right? You all, you all have by your service, but in the path that you're on now, what is it that you could contribute or how, how, do you, how do you change the game on anthropology? I th think of cell phones. Think about the developing world and how many people have cell phones and how many people will skip the point about having a desktop computer or even a laptop. Smartphones are going to be you know, where that's going. What happens with internet connectivity and cell phones and some of the networks? There's something called Project Lighthouse. I don't know. Anybody here heard about that? It has, OK, there you go. <clears throat> Bam! <laughs> I should stop right there. <laughs> An anthropologist. Yeah. So anyway, you know what I'm saying, Shane. We can talk after. If you know, I'm impressed. You know about that. Um, anybody else is curious about Project Lighthouse and what it has to do with? Um, it's it's got some connections to uh, communities that that work at the softer side of warfare. But anyway, uh, I hope that's helpful, Shane. Thank I'll you. I'll add something to that a little bit. As you mentioned, the federal government hires a lot of anthropologists. Same thing with the VA systems because we're a defense contractor. So a lot of times we have a contract from the federal government and we actually do have those folks overseas right now. So they're on contracts, they go back to Iraq, Afghanistan, other countries, and we hire them uh, throughout the business. Actually, I just thought of this. We're not just calling anthropology. I mean, we have to understand our users. That's, that's front and center. If we, if we focus on the user, everything else will happen. So for us, really looking at different groups, communities, and to make what we put out there as services, new services, relevant, whether it's anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world, all of our teams do that. So if you expand it, we're not looking at just talking about that way, I would argue that we have plenty of, of folks to do that. So we, that's another way of looking at it. Thanks. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is uh, William. Uh, Air Force veteran. Um, one of the, I guess, things for me is how do you, so a lot of us have a lot of intangible skills, correct? So we've been, especially post 9 11, a lot of us have been done multiple tours, have, uh, you can drop us anywhere and we'll figure it out, get back home, go back again, figure it out. Um, so again, highly dynamic environments, dealing with crisis, um, you know, problem solving, all these skills. Now, those don't necessarily tangibly. Uh, apply to a specific job that may be on your website. Um, so how do you show those? So today this is a unique opportunity. Past today, how do you translate that into what is going for most of us to proceed forward on, on our job searches with the, the resume? So how do you, do you have any recommendations how you can translate some of those softer skills into the, uh, the one piece of paper that we have that it kind of yeah. Uh, introduce us <clears throat> forward. Rick, yeah, right? let's throw that open. Uh, we're also having a, uh, a session on interviewing uh, and resume building in a moment after this panel is over, so that should be helpful as well. And there's some specific examples. Yeah, is Ron doing that, or is that yes? Ron different? Lobato from City is doing that. Okay, so Ron's going to get up here and he's going to talk exactly to that, and he's going to reference something that uh, 
We have these little blue cards out there, but these, this is this free ebook that we uh, partner with NBCU on, on Heroes Get Hired. And there's a whole section on translatable skills. And I just, I, I wrote these out. I was reading through the book over the last couple months. And it's all the things that you said about what we do, conflict resolution, prioritization, leadership, technology, cultural adaptability. So you don't just have to be an anthropologist. And then it sort of takes it and says, here's what the uh, military would say, you know, dealt with Afghan police or Afghan or Iraqi sheikhs, and then this is how you translate it into here to make the resume more powerful. But stick around for Ron's um, session. He's a Marine, and he gets right at that question. Wait, I think she yes. Oh, I was just going to add, everything you said should be on your resume. I mean, in a skill summary at the top, and this, this is who I am, all those wonderful things you talked about, problem solving, think on your feet, ability to adapt, ability to learn, flexibility. And you will find those words in job descriptions on GE's website. It's, it, it's funny because I was actually sitting with a gentleman from this morning's class and looking at his resume and looking at a job description for a GE job, and all those things you said were in that job description. So I mean, I just saw it this morning and was trying to help him put that on his resume. But that's what we're looking for. It, it's not the environment you did it in or what your MOS was. It's those qualities that, that are really valuable in the business world. So feel good about it. Yeah, you just have to, to have a plan on how to articulate that once you're in an interview, once you're doing a phone interview, whatever it is, you want to be able to, to relay that information to the recruiter that's going to be the one potentially getting your resume to the hiring manager. And once you get into the interview, you want to be able to articulate that based off of the job description, but something that's a well thought out plan, not just to ramble on when you're uh, speaking about it, but you want to get that to them that you can only, you can do the job, but you also have other skills that's going to make you better at that job that somebody else may not have. And I'll give you a quick story. When I was doing my interview at the end, they said, what's, give me a, what's your proudest moment? in the last five years that you've had uh, that will really make us think that you're the right person for the job. I said, my proudest moment was taking 130 Marines to, on a deployment and coming back with 130 Marines. And they're like, okay, no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. So, what do you think that you have to use? You know, use your strengths, because a lot, of person, a lot of people don't have those strengths that everybody in this room has. Should we go back? Yes. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, individuals such as myself who are about to graduate uh, with their bachelor's degree. Uh, I have already completed an internship for, uh, uh, with uh, Towers Watson, which is a, a direct uh, a competitor with uh, Prudential. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, being asked to come back to that company uh, and, and, you know, maybe not uh, liking to, uh, uh, maybe not liking the way that they ran things or the way that they had, uh, you know, the daily office uh, things going and uh, uh, seeing if uh, we can, I, I like personally come to see how things would be uh, at your, you know, company, the, uh, you know, competitors. I don't know if I... <laughs> said that very well but think, well, mr robinson is here from uh, <laughs> prudential all right over here he's going to be on a, yeah, on the say, panel a little bit later in the afternoon yeah. but uh yeah well basically uh, i did an uh, internship for uh, towers watson it's uh, your competitor i didn't really uh like the way that they were running things or you know didn't have a, uh, enjoy my time there maybe was it a was it that you when you landed there they didn't you didn't feel they had a better well, uh, yeah, well, not, well uh, it was uh, other reasons, uh, uh, you know, uh, just uh, they didn't maybe understand things about, like, my disability or, or things like that. Okay. And uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, I, have a, 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 I, I have a family member who works for Prudential, and, and they love it, and uh, I, I wanted to see if, uh, you know, I would like it. Yeah. So, uh, like any company up here, they all have landing, if almost all of them have a landing page for veterans. So if you get to a company that doesn't have one that says something about veterans, there's your first indication. Um, the next thing I would tell you is uh, get on our website, look at what we do. We lay out very plainly that we think veterans are a talent acquisition. We have two full-time uh, vice presidents that do nothing but bring veterans to the company and create programs. 
Um, uh, we have internal and external strategies. We're going to talk about it in one of the next sessions, what, com what our company does and what other companies do. But to answer your question, it, compare, ask about the veteran culture, do they have affinity groups? And uh, somebody mentioned if they're a member of the ESGR, if the ESGR knows who they are and what they do, that's a good indication that they're on the right track. If I could just mention one thing, you did mention that you know someone who works at the company you want to be at, and you're going to learn later that most of the hires that companies make, the best hires that we make come from referrals. So you need to use your networks, whether you know a family member or you know someone else who knows somebody, expand your network so that you can get somebody who's helping to be your advocate. So it starts with you knowing your personal brand, being able to articulate it in a way that gets across what you'll be able to accomplish and do for that company, what value you're going to add, and then have your referral be able to sell you just as well as you could and that hopefully gets you you know past the ATS and the you know applicant tracking system that's going to pair up skill to skill and it's about who you are then very good point yes Hi, good Good afternoon. My name is Steve Rosa. Uh, this question is for you specifically, John. Uh, I'm interested to know a bit more about the junior officer program that you mentioned earlier. Uh, I believe you, you said that it's a rotational program. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more about um, which business lines a city participate in this program and uh, perhaps some other details about the program? Sure, absolutely. And let me, and let me just sort of do a broad advertisement because GE does it too and a lot of companies actually do it. They don't always necessarily advertise it because it depends on volumes and whether or not they're hiring into the program. But you know, if you're, if you're interviewing or if you get into a job fair, ask if they have programs like this because they're not that dissimilar. Um, the, and specifically for this program, it is for the back office, so it's operations and technology. Uh, it does things like uh, put you in uh, levels of responsibility of having um, about 180 people underneath you. Uh, it could be in uh, counter fraud, uh, collections organizations, um, customer service, uh, it might be in program management, uh, but it's all in, in the back office, right? Uh, it also could be on technology as well, although you have to have a bit of a technology background to do it. The nice thing is, is it takes you through three management associate tours. <laughs> Uh, and it's sort of risk-free, as I, as I tell these young captains, and at least in one case, one staff sergeant, I said, it's risk-free, right? You can go in there, make mistakes, go and stretch. No one's expecting you to hit out of the ballpark. Uh, after 18 months, you know, that's enough. We give you also some uh, uh, sort of parallel training. And then the other thing, and this is, uh, and obviously I'm speaking on behalf of City here, I think we do it well. Uh, we pour a lot of energy into uh, giving you a, um, uh, an ecosystem of support. So we assign, you know, if, let's say you had been in the company for six years, doing well on a uh, kind of a leadership track, uh, you're probably meeting some very senior leaders in the company, you give a proposal to them. Well, all of you, in particular, those who've served the last four to six years post 9-11 uh, in combat or just deployed or, or just generally in the service, you haven't had that opportunity. We give you that life credit and we say, okay, we're gonna artificially link you up with a senior mentor in the company, probably at the law, yet like the partner managing director level, and then that helps, because that person not only becomes an advocate for you, but also uh, provides you some really good uh, mentorship. Did you wanna talk about your program? Sure, um, we have the Junior Officer Leadership Program at GE. Um, kind of very specific about who gets into that program. It's junior officers with no more than four to six years of military experience. Uh, and no more than two years out of the military, and if they have been out of the military, those two years need to have been getting an advanced degree. So it's very specific, but then this, um, this group of folks that are, that are in the program, they're all in our industrial businesses, aviation, oil and gas, uh, power and water, and um, now I'm having like transportation, excuse me, that's the locomotive manufacturing business. Um, and it's three eight-month rotations, and each rotation is in a different function, though. So they'll do maybe a rotation in operations on, a, on the factory floor, then they'll move over to maybe marketing for another rotation. They could do a stint in sales, and that's a negotiated uh, kind of who, what do you get to do in your three rotations, a negotiation between you and the business that you're in. So each of the, all three of the rotations are within the same business unit, but with three different specialties, I guess you'd say. And then when you're rolling off, it's again a negotiation between you and the business 
which rotation did you like the best, which is probably the one you did the best at, they all kinds of go together, and then you'll roll off into a, you know, into a, a leadership role within that business. During the two years, there's also a core group of uh, training courses, GE training courses you will go through, um, which is a lot of the things that, you know, folks will get as they're moving through the, their early leadership positions in the company to kind of, in many ways, kind of catch you up with, with your peers, as I guess you'd say, who came straight out of, straight out of, um, of college. Um, and these folks are, are positioned to then obviously grow into leaders within the company. So it's very competitive to get in. Uh, it's a great group of graduates from that program. It started about 12, 13 years ago. Started before I, or started after I joined the company, so I didn't get a chance to do it. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a very good program. So, if but this includes uh, NCOs as well. It does not. It does not. Absolutely for, for not. GA, I apologize. GE, but yes. it's for GE, officers. it's just officers. Okay. Okay. Now, mind you, we still have 2,000 to 3,000 positions. We hire sure. everyone into directly any, at any time, but this is just a very specialized program. So, thank you. Good. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Roberts. I have a question about networking with veterans that's in companies. As we know that uh, there is usually veteran liaisons between companies and uh, and uh, and uh, hiring com and and potential applicants for jobs and everything, what's the best way to reach out to those veteran uh, liaisons and try to network your way into a company? I do know that on LinkedIn there are veteran groups for networking, so you should look into that. Um, there are employees in our company that are in that Avis budget group. Um, but I, I don't know if there's anybody else that has any. Well, I can add a little bit to it. I'm sorry. Okay. I can add a little bit to that. Is that the, one of the things that I do within our company, and Chris does this as well, who's a military equipment manager, if, you, if we get a resume from a veteran and there's not a position for him or her within our company, we distribute that resume with the individual's permission amongst our resources. And I know folks within banking, uh, of defense, of course, government, you name it, because they have veterans. A majority of companies now have military recruitment managers or, or uh, whatever they call them that geared towards military recruitment. So we I distribute that resume amongst everybody. And actually, just in that process alone over the last two years, we probably hired about an additional 100 veterans, not in my company, but through that process. So again, it's all about networking because veterans are going to help veterans. So you never know. So when you send that resume to somebody, ask them, even if you don't have a position within your company, do you mind distributing it amongst your network? And that can get, in turn, uh, circulated some more. So keep that in mind. So Matt, I, I would absolutely agree with that. And I would also encourage you to, um, after you've touched base with companies, think about friends or people that you know who are vets who you would also refer. Because we love that. <laughs> because if, you know, if you're, you're a good candidate, you know other good candidates, let us know because we might not have otherwise found them. And so you know, it goes both ways. Yeah. I just like to add one of the easiest ways to find us is on LinkedIn. We've got a GE Veterans LinkedIn group you can join, obviously, anytime you want. We've got a Facebook page for GE Veterans. It's not GE Veterans, but GE Loves Veterans, we probably should call it. We've got a Twitter uh, Twitter handle. You can follow us at GE Hires Heroes. So there's many ways you can kind of reach out to us in addition to www.ge.com slash veterans uh, to try to get linked into our talent community. Chris just reminded me of something. We have something that we Help the uh, help build for the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, I, IVMF, and Hire Our Heroes. It's called VetNet HQ. So VetNet HQ, and it's a community of, of programs, and it's built on our Google Plus platform. But the part of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, Kevin Schmiegel, Marine, he's running that. And every week there's a different program. Uh, if, if you're making the transition out, if you're starting a small business. But you go on and it's all run off these uh, free video conferences that you can do with Google Plus Hangouts. And that's a way to directly connect because different companies, companies here have participated on that. Mm -hmm. And there may be uh, a session on the financial uh, industry. And, and Steve's, Steve was on it, Prudential was there, some other financial folks in one of the very first uh, events that we had. And so you're there and you can just come up and you can ask a question and then sometimes people, you know, they, they say, oh, well, let's talk offline. So there's, there's a, uh, opportunities like that as well. Yeah. My name is Stephen Hilton. Um, I'm an 82nd Airborne guy. Oh. All right. <laughs> um, I have a pretty specific question but can be cross-sectional. Um, 
I just finished my last class in law school yesterday. Um, and Congratulations. Thank you. And um, I am interested in the, uh, I did my uh, degree in corporate and securities regulation. I'm interested in the uh, compliance space. What I am finding, however, is that um, the qualifications that, that are required includes um, things like funeral licenses um, um, for those kinds of positions. Um, if you do not have those uh, licenses, then it's pretty difficult for you to get into that space. Um, the question is then, um, if you think you have the requisite um, sort of requirements or qualifications, but lack the licenses, um, how do you then um, uh, get introduced into that space? Um, in particular, because you know you do need a sponsorship to um, from any corporation to um, get those licenses in the first place. And then my second question was um, about the rotational program. Uh, if you are outside that two-year window. Um, are there other rotational programs that are available in your corporations um, that we can participate in? Stephen, I'll, I'll jump in. That's a great, great question. Congratulations uh, on law school. I, I, I went to law school after I got out of the SEAL teams, and uh, so we, we can talk after. I've got all kinds of ideas for you. Uh, sometimes in the, in the legal space, there's no getting around that. Um, I know this is the case with Google. It helps if you've gone through a couple years of actually doing something that's related to the practice area. So if you're looking at securities and exchange um, type things uh, and compliance, something, you know, there's, there's certain paths that uh, a lot of times there's just no getting around, like how you're going to have to go through that. I mean, there may be exceptions, uh, but again, this is where it's important to connect. I'm thinking of a colleague of mine. I, I, I worked at Skadden Arps. Uh, it's a New York firm. I was in the DC office when I first got, you know, well, actually after clerking for a year after law school. So a guy named, gentleman named Ramon Harrison. He's over at the Securities and Exchange Commission. An example, uh, and like us, another African American, and an example of someone you could network with. Um, but as far as for Google, I get this question all the time, or we often do, can I come straight to Google out of, out of law school and practice law? It's kind of, I mean, right now it turns out that that's generally not the case. Um, so again, I mean, these are the specifics where you're doing the right thing, right, is to reach out, ask the question, and if I can't answer it, I'll put you in touch with, with, with someone who can. Scott, not to answer, I gotta, I've got to take off. I've got to catch a plane. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're, we're, we're wrapping up. OK. Go ahead. So anyway, I was going to say Veterans Advantage has my contact information. So if there's anything that I can do to assist, if, if anybody needs to, to contact me, by all means, they have my email, phone number, you name it. Please feel free to contact me. Okay, so, and thank you again. You guys are doing the right thing by being here, first and foremost, because there's a lot of thousands of other veterans who are not even doing this as their first step. So you guys are way ahead of that, making that networking connection. And thanks for having me here. So. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Another question over here. Rich Bordner, I'm a United States Marine. Uh, so a lot of you have talked about the programs that you have to get us into jobs in your companies. A few of you have mentioned mentorship and specific uh, programs that you have for qualified candidates. But what kind of programs do you have in your companies to assist us with that transition once we're hired on? Uh, it could be anything from you know career progression and where our careers are going to go to something simple like I, I've worn a uniform for the last 21 years uh, and someone told me what to wear every day. What do I wear to work? I would love to take that one. Um, <laughs> I'm over here giggling. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier we've got the GE Veterans Network and we've got about 10,000 vets running around GE. And um, we love to help new vets coming into the company because we know how it felt to leave the uniform and join a corpor co corporation, and my corporation in particular, GE, that speaks a entirely different language. You know, had no idea half the things these people were saying when I joined 16 years ago because they talked in letters, kind of like we did in the military, but these were different letters that didn't make sense to me. You know, what is the dress code? What can I worked in a factory for my first job with GE? You know, the different types of shoes you could wear. You had to wear the safety glasses, long sleeve, short sleeve, all that sort of thing. And you really need folks to help with that. And that's what the Veterans Network is about in our company. Um, 
on the last panel this morning, I talked very quickly about when I joined GE 16 years ago, we did not have a veterans network. It's only three years old. But I was in a first wave of JMOs that were hired uh, back in the mid-90s. There was 200 of us. They brought us all into the company, kind of decided what to do with us after the fact. And we all found each other and kind of became our own network because we needed help with that translation thing. You needed someone to ask the stupid question of, like, what do we wear to work today? Where the heck do they keep the extra copy paper? You know, is there a casual Friday here? All those kind of questions you don't want to go to your new manager with. You just need to know kind of the nuts and bolts of how this place functions. And that's our biggest tool at GE is our network. We think it's a huge retention tool. Once we get folks in, we don't just say, okay, you're here now, you know, here's the manual, go do your thing. We really do try to kind of bring you along and get you acclimated to the culture and how things run and all that sort of thing. And I think you should look for a company that can they can help you with that because that's a huge, huge piece of being happy in your new job, understanding you know, the day-to-day -day operations is gonna be a very big key to your success, I think, for your career. A lot of us have the affinity networks, and I would say you know, um, they, they talked about the ESGR. That's one sort of an indicator, the landing page, a veteran sort of program. But the network is probably, because that takes a lot of energy, and it's a, in an affinity network, it's organic, right? So, We've got all these folks, we do at City, we have thousands of veterans, and they want to do it, so that's a great plus. The only difference that, not difference, but one thing that Chris didn't mention, I'm sure she does it uh, at GE, is we have a sponsorship program very similar to the way the sponsorship program should have been working for the Marines, Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, where I'm going to this new place, you get a call, uh, and this is very, this is, doesn't really happen, I think, in all of the other sort of affinity groups necessarily, you get a call from a veteran who's probably not gonna be in your field, but at least will be, and let me just tell you a little about the culture here, and, and can I answer your um, not dumb questions? Just your first questions. So it, it's Rick, right? Rich. I'm sorry, Rich. Um, so, so agree uh, with what's been said. Uh, also, you know, we have an affinity group at Google. The key is just really finding somebody who you can get the straight scoop from, and uh, a lot of times there can be a culture uh, adjustment. I think from experience, I, I don't think this is unique to Google, but I think uh, one thing that, that bases bets a lot of times is how do you manage without authority? That's an example where you go, boom, okay, some, some companies, and it, it can be that way, like where it's sort of collaborative, it's, it's a very different type of feel, and it's, it's not like, you know, a gunny saying this is how, you know, this is the law. And, you know, the kind of the structure we have, and we're capable of it. Um, and I have a bias. I mean, I, I know definitely in the SEAL teams, you, you know, it's not, the, you know what I'm saying. In the Marine Corps, same thing. So really just tapping into that and figuring out how you can pair up with someone or folks who are in those affinity groups who can give you that ton of, sort of straight scoop. Here's how things work. And even, even different personalities. Like if, you know, like how people have different styles and just kind of figuring out, okay, this is what you want to, how you want to navigate things, game plan, all that stuff. So it really helps to have a mentor and, and, and you know, seek, seek those folks out. And I'll just go, Rich and I were talking about one thing that for me has resonated. And, uh, you know, there's, there's an old classic by Dale Carnegie. This is going to sound like really dated, but how to win f friends and influence people. Believe it or not, there's a lot of that sort of listen, look at the other person's perspective. But coming off of like, you know, because our, our culture, you know, where everything's just sort of boom, you know, like this is, you know, this is the way it is, it's out in the open and, you know, just got, you know what I'm saying. That shifting gears and, and going into a different mode where maybe people don't always say what they mean, like, you know, right off the bat. I think there's a lot in that, you know, I, I got the books on tape, you know, recently because it's an old classic and I was like, wow, yeah, you know, this is, you know, it's helping my marriage and I just. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the whole thing about two years and, you know, but that's, that's just one I'd throw out there, but that sort of thing, you know, and, and start the process before you get there, but absolutely once you get there, there's, there's resources within companies. One more. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Donald McIntyre, Air Force. Uh, I'm graduating with a bachelor's degree in economics. Uh, my question is, I guess, uh, I'm looking to change careers. Being a man of a certain age, uh, what are my prospects? And two, uh, how does a CFA weigh against uh, getting a graduate degree? 
Do you have a CFA? No. Okay, but you're planning on getting I'm it? I'm not planning on getting one. Okay, right. right. So only because you start off the fine, I'd be really interested in hearing what Cheryl has to say about the, sort of the age piece. Um, look, we're not, you can't discriminate on age, right? So don't worry about that, I would say. Clearly it's going to be, you know, they'll see it either in terms of your experience, or, but it's really about your narrative. And uh, somebody, uh, Harry mentioned to somebody I think earlier today, if um, you've got to make it very clear, in my opinion, that if you're graduating with a BA or a BS in economics, that you're willing to start, oh no, it wasn't you, it was Ron Lobato, who you'll hear from, you're willing to start at a level that probably somebody, let's say, of a certain age would be willing to start at, right? Uh, and we have actually that for uh, officers and senior non-commissioned officers, right? First sergeants are majors, colonels, lieutenant colonels. They come in, they're like, well, I, I want the 05, 06 equivalent in terms of if I had been here at City for the last 25 years, I'd be able to walk in. And just, that's not the case. You don't have the, the set of experiences. How you, however, you have all of these other great things you've done in your life. And that's, I think, the powerful narrative that says, I did all these things, I was in the Air Force, and now I have a credential, match that. Think how powerful that is. As long as the company realizes and appreciates, you're not coming in saying, I want something that the same person of a certain age has. Very good point. Yeah, I would just you know, add, don't define yourself by things like that that can be stereotypes or that would you think someone's going to discriminate you against. It's about what he was saying, your narrative. And your narrative, uh, similar to the gentleman that, I forget your name, I'm sorry, that you were talking about the competencies and the things that you bring to the table, that's your narrative. That's what you want to talk about. And you know, at 27 years old, you look great, so don't <laughs> even sweat it. Right. But, but really, it becomes about that narrative, that, that your personal brand. And if I'm selling myself, it's nobody's business how old I am, how many kids I have, you know, when I went to school. It's about who I am, what I'm bringing to the table, and employers are going to appreciate that that's where your narrative begins. Don't put them in a situation where they're saying, oh, God, why did they give me that information? So, Donald, I, I agree with all that. And also, I, I point out, um, you know, companies can't discriminate, but also that's something internally. Companies, Google, I'm, I'm, I'm actually proud to say we've got a group uh, called the Greglers. Like, you know, and that those are Googlers of a certain age. Um, who just talk about you know issues that face older you know older folk, older folks in the workforce and I think if you're changing another thing to do is in addition to the, narr the narrative it's about trajectory right so really lean into telling the story about despite you know what you've done in the past here's your passion and, and here's also demonstrated things that you're doing that show that you're really leaning in to the to this new role right so th those are the sort of in the do something amazing or you know some innovative things even as you're coming out of this, um, you know, category. Also, the networking is, is, is key, you know, just finding folks who can, you know, give you those extra tips, to, you know, you hit the ground running, you know, that's really important. Um, but I, I think, you know, really just, you know, thanks for your service, and it's great that you're, you know, what, what really counts is the path that you're moving on, and, uh, you know, the same things apply. So. That's great. We're going to take a little break now. Let's have a big hand for the corporate panel. Thank you.